California Water Diva <laughs> and SF, SSV Water Advisor, Felicia Marcus, is the William C. Landreth Visiting Fellow at Stanford University's Water in the West program. Besides her tenure as the public face of the Brown administration's drought response a few years ago, Felicia has led many lives working as the former chair of California State Water Resources Control Board, the head of the Environmental Protections Agency Pacific Southwest Region 9. Um, and uh, during, uh, the, during the Clinton administration and then prior to that leading public works for the city of Los Angeles. She also headed the Western region of the Natural Resources Defense Council, was executive vice president and chief operating officer of the Trust for Public Land and a founder and general counsel to Heal the Bay. And uh, I, we did find this quote that it came up which dates to 2016, right? So that's another drought era about all of the conflicts we have today are going to seem like a picnic if we don't change how we use water. And that means everything. It means conservation, it means recycling, it means stormwater capture, it means desalinization in the appropriate circumstances, and it means more storage above ground and below. So that was 2016, and since we've so since then, I'm sure everybody heeded what you said and everything's <laughs> fixed, right? Yeah, all set. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I was calling this, and first off, uh, this you can explain the background, the uh, um, maybe uh -huh. it, you can see the, in back of you, the serious drought, uh, I, I forget what it says, uh, you, you can move over. Yeah, there you go. Serious drought, help save water. Okay. And these, this was on uh, highway signs, right? All up at Caltrans did it all across the state. But for yeah. a very long time, they were really good partners in messaging, which was fabulous. And in Southern California, people put up all kinds of billboards. Lawn Dude, of course, was my favorite, but that's another story. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So it looks like here we are again. And uh, although, I mean, there's even some indications, uh, I've been reading about the thirsty atmosphere and soil measurements and uh, yep. plant and uh, tree moisture measurements and things. And uh, uh, looks like, uh, as Jeremy Sigmund mentioned, the, the wet century is over. It could well be. It could well be. Every dry year could very much be the first year of a 10, 20, 30, 40, 400 year drought. So we have to take that pretty seriously, even without climate change. And um, well, what what do you think is different this time around? Great. Do you want me to do do you want me to do the presentation or do yeah, we, we want ahead. to just talk? However you no, want to do it. No, I'm I cover go some ahead of these and, things. Uh, um, show us what you have there. Yeah, let's give it a go. Cause I don't got any, I, got any bees in it. Well, you know, I I'm ready to head the, you know, pollinators are precious society cause they are pretty incredible and pretty essential to our, um, survival. So that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother session that we ought to have. Um, I, I'm thrilled to be here and I, I want to go back to just chatting with you, but I thought I'd share Oh, please, just a, yes. a few thoughts, um, and because uh, there are a number of people who may have well heard heard me at other times, I apologize if it's too abbreviated. But I really want to get to the conversation, both with you and the the folks um, who are in the audience, because there's so many different facets to water that it's somewhat uh, overwhelming, whether in drought or not. Um, and I changed my title to what you had said in, 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 you know, in inviting me, you know, here we go again. And the question is, are we going to rise to the challenge of dealing what will be our future and a future we should have predicted by now, but we know is more certain under climate change? Are we going to keep living drought to drought and thinking it's a moment to survive in time? And I think that attitudinal shift is going to be very important and also leads to us having to make some pretty big decisions as a society of Californians or even in a community um, that we've been inching towards but haven't fully embraced yet. 
So I'll do a little bit of the abbreviated version of 101 for folks who haven't um, heard me before, a little bit about what's happening now again, what we can do and are doing it about it as a group and as people, and then just some concluding thoughts to set the stage for conversation. Some of you have seen this, uh, the, in California, we have the most variable hydrology in the country, does it fall? We know that we don't have every year as a wet year. We know that every year is not even what is statistically referred to as a normal year, although that is just a statistical construct. It's not an absolute state. Uh, we know it doesn't fall where most of the people in the ag are, and we know it doesn't fall in the time of year we use it. So uh, what does that mean? That means we've got to figure out how to manage it, which is why we have one of the most extensive public works uh, uh, you know, water public works uh, systems, you know, since the Roman aqueducts. And so I'll talk about that a little. And I, I mentioned the Colorado River because we keep forgetting the Colorado River and we talk about the fights around the Bay Delta, which I'm not going to get into, but happy to talk about, if you like, um, where we're talking about runoff from the Sierras, the Western Sierras, the Eastern Sierras is the LA um, aqueduct issue, but we tend to be focused on the Delta system because it's the one under the state's control. But if you think, if you're in Southern California, half your imported water actually comes from the Colorado. And uh, most Californians don't have as much of a sense of that as they do of the Delta, if they even have it about the Delta. So here's this massive public work system of various kinds, local, federal, and state. There are ones that uh, smaller agencies have all over the place in terms of um, in terms of uh, storage and conveyance that don't make it on the map, but are crucial to certain communities being able to last through these drought cycles. So you have some of the most extensive storage underground and above ground in Southern California because they're the most dependent in some ways by volume on imported water. Again, 30% from the Colorado in an average year, 30% from the Sierra system in an average year, but 40% rely it on local sources, you know, very extensive groundwater basins, except in the San Diego area, manage to capture stormwater. 90% of what runs off in the San Gabriel Valley gets captured for future use. Um, the most advanced water recycling in the world to date is in Orange County. Um, just a, a lot more work happening there and awareness of how to get stuff into groundwater basins and save it. But, but the Bay Area is also an imported water. Um, agency. And here's, here's why this is going to be a, a, a problem for all of us, which is a lot of this water comes from snowpack along the Colorado River, along the Sierras. We need that water. That snowpack ends up being 30% of our storage, you know, that's going to get us through the seasonal problem as it melts out and refills the reservoirs as they let water out. Then they get refilled from behind by snowmelt. It replenishes streams. It slowly percolates into groundwater basins, you know, which are huge but over pumped in the Central Valley. And but they litter across the landscape. Different communities can be 100% dependent on groundwater. Some don't have any. The average is 30% in an average year. We're dependent on that um, for our water supply. In a lot of years, it's 60%. So all of that varies, and it's all managed through these different systems. The problem we have is with climate change and a few degrees temperature rise. I'm gonna come back to temperature as one of the main things I wanna leave you with today. Temperature is key in so many, so many contexts. I won't be able to touch them all, but with just a few degrees temperature rise, we're gonna lose our snowpack here and on the Colorado. The estimates today are 20% less on average in the Colorado basin, uh, about the same in the Sierras, but every prediction we've been making about climate change has been an underestimate. So it's frightening. And so what we see in droughts, and here you see the depth of the drought in March 29th of 2015, um, is gonna be a more regular occurrence, which is why I made that comment about the fights that we have today seeming like a picnic, because we won't have that buffer uh, to save us through multiple dry years. So as I talked about that, you know, with climate change, you also end up even with the same amount of precipitation, we're gonna end up with more of it falling as rain rather than snow, which means more flooding in the spring and less of that snowpack to help us out through the rest of the year. Uh, recorded history uh, shows that we've had 40 and 400 year droughts, tree rings, core samples. We've been in a relatively wet century, essentially, 
Australia went through the same kind of a thing and then hit a uh, six year dry spell where they kept crossing their fingers. It rained a little and then they had the three worst years yet. Their drought ended up lasting 10 to 12 years and they didn't act soon enough. So they had to overspend on very expensive desalination facilities that didn't even get turned on because then it started to rain. People got booted out of office. They still had to pay for it. it took until the next drought for them to turn them on, but they were using older technology. So um, that's why we rang the bell early and started conserving and did such drastic um, uh, uh, mandatory conservation requirements in urban California, because you can't do what we could do in rural California, where people were running out of water, where we were delivering water and bottles and in tankers and drilling wells and running pipe. You can't do that in major metropolitan areas on a dime the way you can in small communities and you shouldn't have to do in small communities either. And that's a, another story where we're in process. Population is going to grow. Agriculture is important, so we can't just throw agriculture under the bus. It's probably too much of a good thing at this point where we've overplanted what the system is going to be able to bear, let alone what the ecosystem can bear and the fights we have between the ecosystem and farming, both societal important goods, but not in balance in any way, shape or form. And protecting nature is something we realize we need, not just for nature's sake, but for our own sake. But why you should care in the Bay Area? Well, as I talked about that system, th there's a fair amount of water that the Bay Area gets from the Delta system. Each one of these water agencies gets their water from different places. And you know, Santa Clara Valley Water District probably has the most complex series. They've got the great groundwater managers, they have groundwater basins, they get water from both the state and federal projects that take Sierra water that comes through the, uh, via the Delta from both the San Joaquin running north and the Sacramento running uh, south. Uh, a number of communities get water from them, but also from the Hetch Hetch, San Francisco's Hetch Hetchy system, which is, comes off the also reliant on snowpack, um, et cetera, very senior water rights, but um, um, still not inviolate. Um, and then you've got Marin, which declared a drought yesterday, which is very heavily dependent on imported water that comes from Sonoma and Mendocino counties. So we're, we're all interrelated, but we're all um, uh, sometimes victims of our own sense of security. So the North-South, Northern California, Southern California divide is kind of illusory and uh, in the sense that the Bay Area is actually more dependent by percentage on water imported from another community than Southern California is. Now, is that a competition? No. It's just, it's, it's basically just a call to say we're all in the same boat and shouldn't be pointing fingers at other people. And we all have a vested interest in what climate change is going to bring. And there's no time like the future uh, to be making progress on moving forward. This is just uh, uh, some numbers about the dependence on water via the Delta, whether it comes through the Delta pumps from the state and federal projects or comes from the Hetch Hetchy system off the Ptolemy the East Bay mud system off the McCullamy. Um, it's coming from an area that's not yours and you acquire either acquired water rights, you have contract rights, et cetera. So again, we're all in this together. But the new normal is gonna be a problem because there is no new normal. There's no normal now really, uh, but there's really gonna be no normal later on because the old normal wasn't normal as I pointed out. Um, and even if it was normal, the future won't be. And climate change adds that twist with temperature probably being the biggest driver. It's just a, a cascade of horribles. You know, you have sea level rise, which is another story. You have the weather pattern disruptions where we're seeing hurricanes in some places I haven't seen a giant flooding. We're seeing the atmospheric rivers come in heavier because of climate disruptions. And two of them parked over Oroville in 2016, which nearly flooded out um, 200,000 people. So it, the disruption factor is huge. Um, the loss of snowpack we talked about, but also as uh, Dennis talked about, this thirsty atmosphere, thirsty soil issue that is driven by temperature where we, run, we have a loss of runoff and alarming differences in the percentage runoff we're getting from the same amount of precipitation, whether rain or snow, which really confounded us at first and really slowed our response, I think, in the last drought. And now the alarm barrels are running, uh, ringing on both the Colorado and uh, 
the Sierra systems for just how dramatic the temperature impact is, which is going to you know, make things worse, but also precipitates us into drought more often than we might be. But it's evaporating on the way down before it even hits the ground. You can have snowpack, it evaporates up off the ground. You have health, uh, uh, thirsty soil sucking it up so fewer less goes down and you have thirsty trees and underbrush and other things that soak it up and so it just it frankly just gets worse and worse picture just to remind you of Folsom during the the last drought uh, hopefully we won't get there during this drought we ultimately sent some limits on uh, how far the bureau could draw it down for deliveries um, in part for the mental health of folks uh, who rely on Folsom Dam although the area of the American River and the partners and the water agencies there through the Sacramento Water Forum have probably one of the best mutual aid agreements and long-term multi-year partnership to get water in the ground when there's ample surface water and to share that water in the groundwater back to the surface water agencies when they're running dry. It's actually a fabulous model that you could uh, duplicate that and uh, the Southern, um, the Santa Ana Water Project Authority in Southern California are probably two of the best multi-agency things. Here's a reminder for those who like charts, what that 2015 snowpack looked like on a chart. Some people see charts, uh, other people like pictures, but the next year was uh, those massive floods and Oroville almost being shut down. So we gotta be ready for, to buckle our seatbelts for a bumpy ride. We know our groundwater depletions have been great and they haven't bounced back. Uh, although we're on the way with Sigma. And we know that wildfires, I don't know why I prefer this Godzilla to, to uh, probably because I just like Godzilla, but I prefer Godzilla's to pictures of flames, um, you know, what it looked like during the peak of the wildfires. And it's entirely likely that we're going to have an equally bad or worse year this year. So we had the wake up call of white wake up calls, uh, the Godzilla of all wake up calls, as I like to say, that we need to uh, uh, deal with. But the only question we have year to year is like, how big is it can be? You know, how big is this year going to be? How many of them are there going to be in a row? Um, and so there, again, no time like the present to do both the uh, personal changes, but more importantly, the systemic and societal changes we need to. This is all exacerbated by the fact that the dryness on these charts now is really bad over the Colorado river system and in Northern California. These maps looked bad through the last drought, but through most of it, the, the extreme and exceptional drought was in Southern California, which wasn't quite as scary, right? Because Southern California gets so much of its water from places that weren't as bad and has done an incredibly good job in off-stream storage and groundwater storage that they're actually in pretty good shape this year, much better shape than some of the Northern California communities because they've been hit by drought more often and they've invested billions of dollars in that plus recycling and stormwater capture and conservation where they do better. But this year we have to think, is this just, this is just the second dry year and we're ringing bells like we were in the third dry year last time, that's frightening. And it's just the nature of the fact that we haven't recovered from the last one. Colorado's in a longer term drought. We had the North Coast was hit hardest, just the nature of the weather this year. So it was the first state drought declaration. Marin County went yesterday um, and they're in a world of hurt. Again, they import a lot of water from other places that happen to be in bad shape and are not snowpack uh, uh, laden uh, areas, um, et cetera. So we've done a lot of things to get in motion and we've exercised our drought response muscles, but we have a lot of things in process to deal with climate change and future droughts that are still in process whether the Sigma Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, our efficiency rules, recycling, all these things that take some time. So it's gonna be a bumpy ride. The LA Times a couple of weeks ago did an editorial, there is no drought. And the, and the headline shocked some people like, what? Everybody's saying there's a drought. And their point was, we can't be looking at droughts as if they're these episodic bad things that happen to us like an earthquake or a hurricane that we just recover from. This is what we're gonna see more of. So we have to do more retrofitting of our systems and our thinking and ourselves to really deal with this nightmare coming at us. What to expect in the next year? You'll see all kinds of conservation calls, uh, Santa Clara Valley, which is always a paragon of leadership on um, water conservation um, has called the uh, voluntary um, 
uh, they may get to stricter rules, but people respond well. People, uh, people in, in Santa Clara County are as experienced as people in Southern California and really do well. Um, Marin, as I said, uh, and more are going to be doing it depending on the situation. You'll see more counties declared in drought. You'll see more fish, bird, and wildlife impacts because they get hammered worse than anyone. You've seen the tanker trucks and fish rescues already. Folks learned from the last drought. Fish and wildlife was ready to go. You're going to see more wells running dry in rural communities, even though we've made great progress in the last few years. Plum Dolivies, Porterville, all kinds of people that were the epicenter last time have been helped, but more are going to run out of water because we haven't solved that whole issue yet. Although, again, the solutions and the money are in motion. You'll see fields fallowed as we did the last time. And you'll see the big fights you always see in front of the water board. I watched a bunch of them earlier this week um, and the typical talking points and typical legitimate concerns. Um, but you'll also see drought angels emerging along with opportunists. And th there'll be more drought angels than opportunists. And, um, and we'll have to take far deeper actions if next year is dry. But as I've said over time, and I'll go through this quickly, there's a lot we can do. It's not time to gnash our teeth and wring our hands and say, woe is us, let's move. There's a lot of room to make progress. We can look at what the Australians did. We can look at what the Israelis did. We don't have to do everything they've done. We can just go shopping, and we have Denmark too, um, on how to manage water in a more integrated fashion and more efficiently. So it's not like we have to invent reinvent the wheel or invent anything. Although inventing a home chocolate maker, I think is a pretty cool invention. I'm still stuck on that. I just have this up to just as a, a placeholder to talk a bit about what's happening in Southern California. It's accelerated since the drought. I mean, one of the things we did was to try and affect a paradigm shift in recycling by doing streamlined statewide rules for more advanced treatment of water for groundwater recharge, outdoor use, um, reservoir augmentation, and on the road to uh, direct potable reuse, really the most advanced rules in the nation, if not the, the world. And it unlocked and unleashed these massive plans now other underway. So where you have Orange County being the largest groundwater replenishment with recycled water project in the world, you now have Los City of Los Angeles and then Metropolitan Water District each proposing uh, programs that are even bigger than Orange County and you have San Diego going very close to direct potable um, recharge. So you're gonna see Southern California will be the metroplex of climate adaptation in the urban context in the world, coupled with the great work you all are doing in the Bay Area on uh, adapting to sea level rise. California Water Action Plan from the Brown administration, all of the above is the point. We gotta do all of it, we can't argue about which. Newsom, Governor Newsom has built on that and is taking it the next step. You've got farmers trying to figure out how to get water in the ground faster when it's there. Um, you've got people using floodplains for flood control and ecosystem. You've got uh, folks talking about managing healthy forests to avoid conflagrations for climate and allow more water to stay more snowpack to be able to stay on the ground and get more water to run off into our reservoirs. And there's been a data and technology revolution with sensors, predictive capability, satellites, treatment technologies and big data that allow us to be much more precise in how we manage water if we want to. Here are just a few examples I won't go through that where we're gonna have predictive capability to actually do a much better job managing uh, it, 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 it. Our social structure and our water rights laws and our ability to implement are far behind what we can do technologically. We can predict temperatures in a way that will help us do it better. We can find leaks. Uh, much more cost effectively through sensors than having to replace all our pipes. We lose 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, and even 50% of water in urban communities to leaks. Uh, and that's not just your toilet running, though you should definitely check that. But it's also uh, pipes. Um, they call it non-revenue water. And uh, it's very expensive to replace the pipes. But with sensors, you can predict where to do it, or you can hear for leaks in the home or uh, in the street, and you can you can cut your costs of uh, blocking leaps by 90%. So amazing stuff happening. When I say schmutz, it's the water quality testing that allows us to have faith in recycled water treatment and other things. There's just so much stuff happening that we can use, um, and we can provide safe drinking water at lower cost, which is also important. Here's what we need to do, though. We, we can't take water for granted anymore. No one's an island. We have to think collectively 
but we need to act and we have to engage across traditional vibes to figure out how to get to the healthy ecosystems, community, agriculture, economy, and society we want, as opposed to it be a fighting and talking point flinging society, which is what we've had the luxury of doing or we've had the history of doing in California and we don't have time for that anymore. So the few takeaways, we've got to raise awareness for people that this is our future and not an aberration to be periodically survived and we're not gonna make it if we don't. We've got to make progress on ecosystem management which some of you heard me talk about and dealing with ourselves to be able to work with each other. We have to get our ecosystem progress to match our technological progress and we can all do something, uh, whether it's lawns and leaks or investing in resilience or supporting good policies and politics or um, supporting politicians that look towards the future versus seeking to divide us. And with that, thank you and be nice and listen to Jeremy. I like what he said, <laughs> be nice. So with that, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Felicia. I, I did want to get back uh, um, and show off the edited background that we have up. And uh, love it. It says water palooza, but I this is um, adjusted for uh, a palooza. Yes. But, uh, um, we now speaking of Jeremy, there was a uh, question he had. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I just grab it. Um, Ah, here it is. Um, what, uh, what is the most surprising thing under development right now in California water policy that can help us weather this current and future droughts? I think it's the movement towards more recycling and stormwater capture excuse me, in urban California, just the sheer scale of it. I didn't even talk about the stormwater capture mm -hmm. program in all of LA County, 300 million a year, you're gonna see the face of LA change through projects all over that park fork area that are gonna be capturing water. Nature-based solutions, I think is the most exciting thing where we're restoring nature in order to save ourselves. And the Bay Area is doing the same with wetlands to buffer sea level rise rather than uh, 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 seawalls. Well, apparently we need a lot of dirt. We do need a lot of dirt. Sediment is precious. Exactly. We learned on a wet talk with some of the stewards of the bay that uh, there's a, a, a huge need uh, that there shouldn't be any dredging that doesn't result in propping up the the bay side for uh, sea level rise. Um, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful um, vision of uh, restoration. You know, it's and it's it's all over the state. I mean, the growth of people who are into beavers and beaver dams and restoring mountain meadows and all that, the multiple benefits we can get is pretty, pretty incredible. I get most excited about that. There are technology, too, in terms of sensing and open ET and figuring out how to use water more efficiently. But that's also all pretty cool. But the uh, nature based Kirby solutions. had a quick question. Um, clarifying question. What is a drought angel? And how are oh, they that's such a good snowing? question. And I see Anthony's question, which I can also answer quickly. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were drought angels through the last year, and they were just incredible. I'll just give you a few. There's this woman, Donna Johnson, who rocked it <laughs> in East Palo Alto. Right, exactly. Who, um, who I can actually do one with my filter now, but I won't. Um, who uh, uh, was delivering bottled water in the trunk of her car for uh, months, if not years, to people around East Porterville and raising the profile of the issue and she and the other activists did an amazing job getting the media to cover it. Like those people have been drinking crappy water for decades and it's been hard to get attention. But the fact that they were running out of water provided an opportunity to elevate in the public consciousness that here in, in the time, 2016, in you know the most advanced um, civilization on the planet other than, well, there are more advanced civilizations, but you know, in a very advanced uh, fifth largest economy in the world, we still had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who couldn't rely on clean, safe water. So that, that promoted a, a political uh, tidal wave. You also had farmers who volunteered to give up uh, really senior water rights holders, never happened before. It's sort of against the code, volunteered to give up 25% of their water um, 
because people were hurting elsewhere and they didn't want it to look bad. You had farmers that planted their rice fields later so you could conserve more cold water in Shasta to be used to help fish and uh, uh, later in the season, knowing that they were gonna have a 15 to 20% cut in their yield. It, it you know, didn't work, wasn't quite enough. It'd been nice to have more, but it was still something that was unusual and unprecedented. And then you just had people who were running pipes and connecting people to their wells you know, all over the place. It was, it was really nice. And, and there were people, the fighting words continued, but some people held their powder a little more than they do in non-drought times. Other people were total jerks. So it's never perfect, but I prefer to see the angels. So in the, in the future, will agriculture just be all about almonds and pomegranates? No, in some cases, you know, it's not the almond that's the problem. It's too many of them in the wrong place, you know, cause you can get more pop for drop with an almond. But if you just keep planting it over an overdrafted groundwater basin and then have more incentive to fight against a fish, it's not helping us get where we need to go. But you can use almonds to use less water and maintain a local economy if you manage it. So it's not the almond or the pomegranate that's the problem. It's volume. That's yeah, the problem. That was more of a snarky comment than anything. Else. That's all right. I mean, and I was nice about my response. Yeah. I mean, you know. And the... the uh, actually, uh, Anthony's question about the, uh, I think would be kind of uh, illustrative, uh, the pros and cons of reclaimed water versus desalinization. Yeah, it, I, I think the thing that's most interesting there is the space I've been living in since I left the water board in particular, because it's so exciting. Um, a, a couple of things. Um, recycled water, if you have a place to put it, like a groundwater basin, is just much cheaper. Because even though even advanced recycled water takes, uh, you know, you're adding microfiltration and ozonation and most use reverse osmosis. Now, as we get to higher levels, and we're also using membrane bioreactors, but these um, uh, reverse osmosis tubes, which you can go do a great tour, either virtually, I've been on it, or you can go in real life, I've been on that one too, at Santa Clara Valley Water District, because they're one of the key demonstration facilities in the state for purified water, you know, they have these membranes that are rolled up tightly, like a, a totally tight roll of bolt of fabric, except it's not fabric, it's all these membranes. And you, you force water through it and you, the size of the little holes in the membranes is smaller than anyone could see, um, really filter out whatever you're trying to filter out. And salt, like from the ocean, is a lot harder to get out than schmutz and chemicals of all kinds. It's just the nature of the chemistry of all of this and physics, I suppose. And so to do desal takes a lot more energy to produce the water. It has other benefits. I mean, there are other things they don't have to do, but it's just much more expensive. It also has much greater marine impacts because both in the intakes and in the discharge that need to be dealt with. And we did desal rules during the drought to kind of level the playing field, but to make sure desal was carrying its freight and dealing with its externalities. Um, because there's a lot of marketing push to do it because people make a lot of money. And so there's a lot of politics in it, but it's not always the smartest thing financially or environmentally. On the other hand, if you don't have a groundwater basin or a place to put it, desal starts looking better if you're vulnerable, which is why San Diego has spent so much money per acre feet to be able to um, just do 7% of their portfolio with desal because they're at the end of the pipes coming from the Colorado and the Sierras and they don't have a groundwater basin in which to capture storm water or to put recycled water. So they're the leaders in going to reservoir augmentation and ultimately uh, direct potable. So again, the circumstance depends on where you are, but um, I can guarantee you that San Diego wishes it had a groundwater base. And if it did, it'd be doing recycling rather than uh, desal. But yeah. there are some places don't have options. Central Coast has a number of places, don't have a lot of options. So in some places it, it is appropriate. And as the technology improves, it'll become more appropriate and cheaper and less energy intensive and greenhouse gas emission producing all those things. But right now it, um, you, you gotta, it, it has a heavier, lift to be an appealing option. Now, brackish water desal has a lot of appeal because it doesn't have the same environmental impacts, doesn't take as much energy because you're not getting as much salt out of it. That's uh, as technical uh, as I get. Oh, no, no, that, that, that's good. <laughs> I mean, basically, if you're talking about just even the difference between, say, reclaimed water versus desal, it's 
energy level, say energy one money, big reason, and uh, and caught and therefore cost. Um, I did want to get to. There's one last question. We're running, in, of course, into overtime, but uh, um, that's. Uh, I think that that would be fine for a few minutes. That we can, uh, unless people are looking to do the vegan chocolate and. Well, why wouldn't someone? You know, that's pretty cool. That was the quiche kind of thing, but um, the. Um, issue uh, really. Um, Carol Steinfeld had a question about. Oh, Carol. Uh, well, I mean, it's more about public will, and and uh, uh, but really, uh, it boils down to uh, just issues about draws from the Tuolumne River. Um, and now, this you know, the past year or two, there's been a lot of um, stuff on. Uh, just even even the allocations on the Tuolumne. I know mm -hmm. uh, um, there has been a, there's been lawsuits uh, uh, and uh, you know in terms of the draws and there's been a real we did a whole wet talk on uh, the high cost of uh, demand forecast because the forecasting models um, uh, Pacific Institute. Uh, had done uh, a study on forecasting models, uh, 20 agencies through the state over 20 years and how, how off they were, right. but they were used to justify the drawing down of the Tuolumne and now mm -hmm. it's drought time. So, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, in wrapping up this first day of Sustainable Palooza, what would you recommend as far as movement forward uh, in terms of protecting, you know, the the river levels and therefore the fish populations and, and all the stuff we value versus, you know, urban water use uh, mostly? Well, I guess it's a combination. I mean, there's a lot of irrigation districts involved too. Yeah, I, you know, I I would say do what do what Jeremy said. Be kind. I think I think though there's a whole ethic and ethos in the water community. It's not evil, but it's to protect every drop. And you can be as noble about why you want to do that. And, and there, are, these are about competing goods, not about good and evil. But people can go to extremes and game their numbers to make themselves look better. It's not unusual and people do it all the time. But I think we really need to honor the fact that we need a healthy ecosystem for a whole host of reasons, uh, in addition to um, what we currently use water for. And the fact of the matter is, particularly in the urban context, there's a lot more we can do um, in order to save water, even though, you know, San Francisco in particular is the, you know, one of the most efficient urban centers in the country, if not the, um, it, it, not just the state, and that's the city, but its service area is a lot bigger than that. And there's some issues there uh, with their contracts that I won't get into, but I think having a fair conversation of what the alternatives and the options are so the public understands that you could do other things and not take as much from the Tuolumne, particularly during critical years like this, when the fish are at death's door, as opposed to um, uh, other times, is, is just a political question and political will that I, I actually think people should be understanding and speaking up about. Now, I don't mean to be speaking in code, but I think that, I think you can you can game an argument any which way and feel very justified in doing it. And this, I think we really need to figure out uh, how to find a better way, because the irony of having um, any water districts, let alone um, San Francisco, be a part of the demise of a fish uh, species as iconic as salmon, let alone the rest of the ecosystem, I think is a sorry tale. Um, and uh, very good people can feel very confident in what they're doing. But I think we need to have honest conversations and open science and not uh, the gaming and the fighting that is endemic in the water world and then makes it seem okay. It's, it's actually not okay for the rest of us. No, in terms I mean, the of, numbers... Uh, as a, as a no, we, no. as a species, and who we are uh, depends, I think, in part about how we take care of our natural heritage because you know history is not going to look on us kindly if we let these fish go extinct because we were arguing at the margins yeah and um i believe there are now the water board had 
their 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 draft levels and stuff i guess mm -hmm. is now um the the standard but uh which did give it hasn't been implemented yet yeah it needs that's so part that of the really problem you can do set the standards but implementing it is a whole water rights process yeah, that hasn't so, been moving and is very difficult so there's just a lot more to do and hopefully you know people coming together to to manage for all of the multiple needs will make it work better but we're we're definitely um behind the eight ball in a big time. And, and we're running the risk of losing these species, not just on the Tuolumne, but in the whole system within our lifetimes, which is something that maybe even in the next five to 10 years, which is something that would have seemed incomprehensible before. So yeah. we've got to give a little. Well, frankly. it's hard to give a little when there's active lawsuits going on. So um... well, sometimes lawsuits are the only thing that sell it. It's not lawsuits <laughs> per se aren't bad. Sometimes the, the political structure can't get it done for political reasons and you need a court to say do it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I'm ambivalent agnostic about, I, you know, I didn't want to have to go to litigation, but sometimes that's the only thing that gets you a reasonable settlement that people, people can't give water away, but they can lose it. And so maybe that's the forcing mechanism that's real enough to get people to work together a little bit more. That, I'm yeah. really simplifying it, but. Well, it's a good last word. Um, I lose sleep over this one, so. Yeah, and uh, uh, so we, I know um, Sustainable Silicon Valley, you know, just will be highlighting this issue uh, quite a bit because uh, the light needs to be shined on it, good. you know, and, and these times are, uh, you know, they're desperate times for a number of areas and, but, you know, the fish can't talk, so. That's uh, right. You know they 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 need an advocate as well um so uh, anyway thank you very much for wrapping up the sustainable palooza day one and congratulations on a great day one um yeah i mean everybody's been great and uh uh there's so many things to talk about i un unfortunately we're we're talking about drought again but uh and uh, I'm sure we'll 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 talk about it a little more in different uh, venues. So, uh, but with that, um, thanks for having me. Let's just leave and think about chocolate and bees and and tomorrow fish. Perfect.